By my reckoning, at least, the first wave of Power Miner sets was a complete success in terms of design. The first seven playsets introduced us to an iconic color scheme, memorable and lovable villains, and at the same time resurrected a fan favorite theme, Rock Raiders. So how do you follow up on such a great first wave of products? Uh, you make them bigger, of course. Let's take a closer look. In front of me today is the complete second wave of Power Miner sets released in June of 2009. LEGO's release strategy in 2009 is largely identical to the format they have today. January sets are typically smaller and more affordable, and June's releases are larger and more expensive, getting out on shelves ahead of the Christmas season. A good example of this release schedule today would be 2021's Harry Potter sets. In January, we got four of the Hogwarts Moment sets, which are right over there, priced at $30. That was it. Then in June, we got a number of play sets ranging from $20 all the way up to $120. You don't need to look too hard to find more examples of that continuing to today. And we see the same thing in Power Miners. January gave us seven sets, only one of which was priced over $30. The second wave takes the complete opposite approach, where there's only one set out of the five that is under $30. The sets themselves are not the only thing that are getting bigger though. The rock monsters are getting bigger too. It's a way to naturally raise the stakes and keep the sets exciting. Some of LEGO's marketing strategy will forever remain a mystery to us, and this wave seemed particularly strange on that end. A lot of the marketing campaign that came out with the initial launch of the theme died down heavy. There was not as much promotional videos on the website or anything like that. And two out of the three sets here were actually marketed as limited retail releases, which is highly unusual. You usually only get one set out of five, not two out of five. That's almost half of the wave. Definitely half the wave's value here was a limited retail release. And in fact, I've heard people say that some of these kits were not even available in their home country back in 2009. We'll go into it a little bit more later, but some of these are very, very difficult to get your hands on. Let's start off with the smallest set, which is the Crystal King. Coming off the first wave of sets, the Crystal King feels like a dream come true. It is just the perfect progression to get that final boss in that summer wave. And what a final boss the Crystal King is. So Crystal King is set number 8962. The whole thing has 168 pieces, retailed for $19.99 and includes two minifigures in addition to the Crystal King himself. You can tell the set remains pretty desirable to this day as a new one is going to set you back $75, well over three times the retail value just over a decade later, and a used version of the set is about $25, which for the most part is in line with other used Power Miner set prices where you can get them for about retail price or just a bit over. Before we get to the beauty that is the King himself, let's look at these two Power Miners figures, because actually these are two of the cooler figures that we've seen. The first power miner here is pretty special as this is the only instance in which we get a hairpiece for one of the power miners. And he finds himself in a pretty bad situation to not have his helmet on him. The other figure is not unique to this set, but his accessory is, which is this backpack mounted drill. All I can think is this thing must be incredibly heavy and difficult to operate, but it looks really cool. Unfortunately, if you don't have this guy set on some studs, he is not going to stand up very well on his own. I found he has to be leaning pretty far back to make that happen. Still, I love the apparatus he has. It actually does spin pretty well on the end and looks surprisingly good for how few pieces it is. However, that's all our boys got when they're going up against the Crystal King. Might as well grab a smaller one for a size comparison. This set unfortunately does not include Sulfurix, but he barely comes up past Crystal King's ankles. Crystal King features obviously a lot of brick built construction with the addition of some very specialized elements, most notably for his head, which includes two different pieces, a jaw and a headpiece both making use of these awesome trans neon green teeth. And he's got some printing for his eyes on the top. On the back of his head are bar holes to place these additional teeth pieces in light bluish gray. The specialized headpiece works really well here. It continues the same vibe that you get off the smaller rock monsters. And even though I am a sucker for brick built things, I think this was a good call. 
The other great thing about a head this size is that it fits minifigures rather well, unfortunately. Whether or not the Crystal King eats all your power miners is up to you, but I guess I'd say it's nice to have that option. The only thing that's a little odd is obviously you can see straight straight through his mouth quite easily when it's opened up. It doesn't lock in between wide open and close shut. There needs to be like uh, another locking point like in the middle, because this is too much. That's, that's closed. There needs to be something, something like that would be nice. The other specialized piece here um, are these, what, four by four by four triangular armor plates. So these are printed again. It's a very good print. The dark bluish gray paint lines up with the dark bluish gray plastic, which is something we could only dream about having today. But that's on top of a trans neon green base. The brick itself is textured in addition to the printing. The other piece that you might not be too familiar with are these spikes in the back. These are actually flexible. These were introduced with Exo4s, I believe in 2008 for the Jungle Wave of sets. It's honestly one of the pieces that I'm really surprised is still in production today. I just saw it released in the new Avatar sets for The Way of Water with like turquoise and sand green. It's really fascinating, but yes, so that you don't actually impale yourself on the ends, only that end bit is made of a flexible material. The bottom portion of the brick is the familiar ABS. It's really interesting. Crystal King has a great range of motion utilizing ball joints throughout. He can also move his fingers. It's pretty easy to make the guy stand up too, which is great because his feet are massive. Around the back, he isn't looking as hot as he is in the front, but it's not the end of the world for a $20 set. And hey, we should talk about that. It is quite surprising to get the final boss in the cheapest set of the wave, and I think that's awesome. What if the Titanium Commandery was the only set to come with this guy? I, not a lot of kids are going to be able to get that. Um, so I love that this guy comes on his own, is very affordable, and I think that's a great strategy. And it's, again, something we don't see much anymore, unfortunately. And for that, and for the many other reasons I talked about, uh, this is probably one of my favorite sets in the lineup. This had to happen at some point, and I think the way they did him is perfect. The second smallest set of the wave also has a lot to bring to the table. This is set number 8693, Rock Wrecker, with 225 pieces and retailing for $34.99 back in 2009. One thing that I like about this set right off the bat is that it continues that numeration system that we saw in the first wave of sets. If you recall, I ended that first Revisiting Power Miners video with Boulder Blaster, which was marked number seven. And as you can see here, Rock Wrecker is number eight in the vehicle lineup. Of course, we need to highlight the figures here first before we get into the set. For our Power Miner, this is Rex. He's technically exclusive to the set because he is donning goggles for the first time, but otherwise you've probably seen this guy before. And then we have our first rock monster big fig. This is Geolix. He is the trans neon green big fig rock monster. Oh, and isn't he a beauty? Much like Crystal King, he dwarfs the smaller sulfurix uh, by a lot. I love the continuation of the same color scheme though. It seems like you could have yourself a beautiful little rock monster family. Isn't that delightful? Geolix is composed of a few different parts here, including arms that can be detached, which just make use of the familiar ratcheting joint system. He's also got two crystals on his back. Even though he looks to be two separate elements, the trans green and the dark bluish gray, those are connected together in the factory because inside there are a bunch of other components to enable this feature to work. The set includes one rock, for him to chuck at the rock wrecker. Okay, I didn't mean for that to happen. There you go, pretty effective. And if you run out of rocks, you can always beat up the vehicles with your fists too. Unlike last fight, which was a little rock monster sided, this one might be a little power miner sided. The rock wrecker has one of the coolest play features in the entire theme, and it's very simple. Much like the thunder driller, rolling this thing around will actuate some drilling motion, as you can see here. All in all, there are eight blades moving as you drive this thing along, which is a pretty impressive number of blades four at the base here, and then the four massive ones around the cockpit. The build itself to accomplish this wide range of motion is so ridiculously 
simple. In fact, I can pull the blades off here and you can see everything that's gone into making this motion possible. It's, it's literally just this. The blades are attached to this. They basically just operate as large gears to keep the other in motion. There's no way that the designer figured out something like this overnight, but he makes it look so easy. But the action doesn't stop at those mighty blades. There's also some fun stuff going on in the back, including a net launcher. And net launchers historically do not work very well in Lego. So let's see what damage we can do with this. So, wow, just a nice little press this time. Okay, that, that didn't work. Yes! Anyway, that's a thing that exists. In the back here too, we have some tools, shovel, and a pickaxe. And there is a small compartment which holds, interestingly enough, two smaller crystals. Uh, something that we really haven't seen up until this point. To be totally honest, I don't like them. That's Mars Missions Realm. Stay out of it. If you can fit a large crystal in here, I'm gonna be very upset. You can fit a large crystal. They could have just included another large crystal. I don't understand. In the back is something definitely worth highlighting. These are the familiar power miner drill wheel pieces, and they are used here backwards, effectively, uh, and they fit perfectly into each other to create a very unique single wheel design, and I like it. I like it a lot. Could have used some covers, perhaps, on the inside, uh, but overall, I, I like the creativity going on here. There's this weirdly open, unused space in the back. Is this like some sort of troop transport, perhaps? You can move miners around? It almost feels like it should have come with another power miner, if indeed that was the purpose. The cockpit is pretty fun. I do wish this hinged up. Uh, it's actually attached by four studs, which makes it a little harder to come off uh, than most. Great parts usage here with this upside down windscreen to get a really fun angle. And then on the inside, we have room for Rex, of course, a steering wheel, and then behind him actually is a coffee machine, which continues the funny trend of power miners to include a lot of food items and food accessories in their builds, which is just awesome. I mean, these guys gotta eat and drink too. If you wanna pick this thing up for yourself, a new version is going to be about $65, and a used version is gonna stick right around that sweet, sweet retail price of 35 bucks. The play feature here is incredibly strong. Getting one of the big fig rock monsters in a relatively inexpensive set is great too. I love how unique it is. It's going to fit in nicely alongside the first seven sets. Um, and the scaling is right too. It's not gonna feel too out of place. But from here on out, uh, they're only going to get bigger. So next up is Cave Crusher, that's set number 8708. This has 259 pieces altogether and would have retailed for $49.99. This is one of the limited retail availability sets that I was talking about earlier. And I actually am fortunate enough to have the box for this set, which you can see does indeed say special edition. So this one has proven particularly challenging to get. And it is certainly one of the more expensive purchases I have made for a used Lego set. However, as a kid, this one always fascinated my brother and I because there wasn't a lot of info out there about what this set did. In fact, it wasn't until very recently that I actually knew that it could do this, this snake-like motion. I thought at best, maybe only the front row did it, but in fact, this is made in three sections. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at the figures real quick. We've got two power miners in this set. Neither are exclusive. Our named character here, Duke, also appears in Thunder Driller and Titanium Command Rig. The more noteworthy figure, of course, is going to be our second big fig rock monster, which is Tremorox. He is done up in trans red this time around. Everything else is identical to Geolix. He features that same throwing arm function and also squeaks terribly. The main gimmick of this set is the spinning blades here in the front, which again are activated by cheater wheels and work quite well. You can see here too that this is vehicle number nine picking up right off after Rock Wrecker. This thing presents so different on the box and in the catalogs than what I was expecting 
to get here. Just the configuration they have it in here makes it look so much more bulky than it actually is. The thing is incredibly narrow. All that's supplying any sort of width to the thing are those wheels. Looking at this thing from above, you can see, especially that middle and back section, are at best five, six studs wide, and then it's all wheel, which is, is interesting. Uh, but there's still a lot of interesting details here that I, I haven't grown to expect from power miners. Um, and this is very much a Mark Stafford set. Uh, Mark Stafford designed or had a role in designing a great many of the Power Miners sets. In fact, he had a great role in designing many of the sets produced during this era of LEGO. Um, but there is something very different about this set. Um, attempts to clean it off and detail it in a way that I'm just not used to seeing from this line. For instance, the use of these 4x4 radar dishes in the wheels is really great. So many of the other wheels are left open, sometimes with obnoxious colors. Even Thunder Driller, my favorite set, has tan here and dark bluish gray here, which is a little off-putting. Most of the vehicles feature their vehicle number very prominently on the cockpit cover or somewhere else, but this one has three different stickers, uh, one on either side of the cockpit and then one on the engine hood, all on two by twos. Uh, so just a little smaller, a little different. Um, and the detailing up here, again, is really nice. And I love the roll cage over the glass. There's a few other play features here as well. We got this flame cannon, which is quite interesting to me. I'm not exactly sure what that's going to do. You can't exactly melt rock monsters. Then up here, there is a launcher. Uh, that launches this spinning blade, which I can imagine would be pretty effective against some foes. In that middle section too, we have our familiar pickaxe and shovel clipped onto the side. And then the back section is pretty interesting as well, featuring a detachable workstation. So it looks like we get two crates, of course, one of them featuring a stick of dynamite, and then we have this system. And I suppose to some extent we just gotta use our imagination here, but there are two canisters of something in here, and it says warning flames. So it looks like there's a mini flamethrower in this set too. I just really find it hard to believe that fire is going to be effective against rock monsters. I love the inclusion of these Mars mission flexi tubes. That's great stuff and that can just slide back into place. And it clips on rather precariously to a single one by one white clip. It's a good looking set, for sure. Is it worth $50? Was it worth $50? Probably not. It does take up a lot of space, but you gotta realize that most of that is accomplished by the use of 12 big wheel pieces. This is the cheapest set to get Tremor Ox in. The other set that he's going to come with that we'll see very soon is bigger and twice as expensive, but the scarcity of this set continues to lead Tremorox to be a quite valuable figure. I must confess this one didn't live up to the hype that I had for it when I was a kid, but I still like it by all means, and I appreciate that they've continued to do something very unique for all these vehicles. I do have the instructions too. I have to page through them here to see if there's anything noteworthy here in the end. We get some pictures of the play features and also the main three models of the Wave that were regularly available everywhere. And the essential Rock Monster checklist, which I think is absolutely fantastic because let's be real, that's got to be one of the main reasons why people bought as many sets as possible. You got to get these guys, they're the best. This is actually pretty sweet. So this features all of the sets from the first two waves, uh, excluding the special edition ones, which would be Underground Mining Station, Cave Crusher, and Boulder Blaster. But I think most everybody else is in here. I don't see the claw one. That's weird. Uh, stuff like this is great. And the omission of things like this is why I hate the new instruction manuals, which I will not go into any further because uh, this video is long enough as it is. 
I can totally see LEGO wanting to do something big for the 10th vehicle in the Power Miners lineup. And yes, that's exactly what they did with set number 8964 Titanium Command Rig. The massive vehicle you see here is composed of 706 pieces and this set retailed for $99.99 back in 2009. That is a very large, very expensive playset, especially for a LEGO in-house theme back in 2009. We get four minifigures in Titanium Command Rig. We get technically, very loosely what I'll call an exclusive variant of Brains. The only difference here is that he has a visor instead of goggles or no goggles. It's a similar situation for Doc who also has the visor, but we've seen something like this figure before in Thunder Driller. And then we get Duke who appeared also in Cave Crusher, so we saw him just a bit ago. This is the only set to include a small rock monster and that is Glaciator, the trans dark blue rock monster, and then we also get Tremorox, and of course, both are fantastic. The thing is undeniably impressive. It's massive. It is definitely the biggest set in the entire Power Miners theme. Last Wave's largest set, the Crystal Sweeper is barely half the length of it. When it comes to functionality, there's a few familiar things going on here. There's a net launcher, much like in Rock Wrecker. This time we get a double flick-fired dynamite launcher. And perhaps the biggest and most obvious is a Thunder Driller-like ability to spin the blade. Again, this is just accomplished with cheater wheels underneath the model. This is intended to be the mobile headquarters of the Power Miners. It's obviously a vehicle of sorts, but it can become more of a station. It becomes a sort of drilling tower. In all honesty, this is a better look than I ever expected it to be, and it works quite well. The tower itself is not heavy, so it can be easily held in place by these two Technic ratcheting joints. From there, you can still spin the drill at the base as this axle becomes exposed when you lift the thing up and you get that awesome drilling motion. You still have access kind of to your weapons up here and you have a command tower on the top. I love the fact that this thing is dotted all over the place with heavy spotlights so you can see what you're doing. Everything seems appropriately well lit. Once the tower is up too, it exposes a number of things going on underneath. Inside, we have the only instance in which one of these smaller rock monsters appears in this second wave of sets, and that's poor Glaciator, who has been captured in a cage. Opposite him are two computers and two seats for our power miners to do some sort of research on him. In the crate behind the computers is another banana similar to the one that we saw in Crystal Sweeper. We got these big Mars mission cables again, which is fun to see here in orange. Our cage here can actually be transported around making use of this crane. So this crane is very overcomplicated probably for what it needs to be, uh, but it's cool. Uh, so there's this raising function, which can be accomplished on the opposite side of the vehicle using a crank to move it up and down. In addition to that, this part of the crane can also be raised and lowered and it just catches on these tooth bricks here to lock it into place. And then there is yet another crank to raise and lower the hook itself. And of course, this whole thing can rotate. After you've made all of the appropriate adjustments, theoretically, you should be able to latch on to this. It's just connected in there by some clips, but then you can lift it and transport it around wherever you're wherever you want it to go. You might as well lower this again. Very weirdly, uh, there is an additional hook here on the back of the model. I really am not sure what this is supposed to do. You could tow another vehicle behind you, perhaps. Uh, you could drag the cage behind you. This is just a weird inclusion, and I hate working with Lego strings, so it seemed altogether very unnecessary, and now I've broken it. Excellent. It's hard not to be impressed by the size of this thing, but I think the thing that doesn't impress me so much is how hollow and empty the headquarters of the Power Miners here is. This is supposed to be the Mobile HQ, and there is nothing except two computer desks down below. 
there was so many opportunities to fill some of this with living space. I like the addition of the rock monster cage to some extent, and I get it, but I feel like a much better use of this huge open space here would be like a kitchenette, some beds, something. Again, playing to the fun that they've been adding with the things like the coffee machine, the bananas. What if there was like a pool table? What if there was something like that that would feel make this feel so much more like a headquarters? As it is, it just feels like an oversized, less good looking thunder driller. And I, I, I do like this set, I really do. Uh, but it just leaves me wanting a little bit more for a hundred dollar set back in 2009 that's insane uh with 700 pieces even if you figure this guy's worth 10 bucks you're still coming up about 25 percent short from a price to part standpoint and there are big pieces in this set but there are also a lot of small technic pins holding this model together. If you want to pick one of these things up new, you're going to look at shelling out about $250, and a used one isn't too terrible, going for about $120. Parting this thing out was even cheaper, I think. The only thing that's going to be a killer is yet another trimmer X. Yeah, this one's a mixed bag for me, for sure. Fun to play with. Definitely, especially if you're, oops. Especially when you're a kid and this model is basically as big as you. Pretty awesome. And speaking of big, we've got one more big one. Set number 8709, Underground Mining Station, is unlike any other Power Miner set we've seen so far. For starters, it's the first building, non-vehicle, that we've gotten from the theme. And interestingly enough, it is still given a number. It is designated number 11 in the lineup. It's by no means meant to be a headquarters, but instead serves a very different, but very specific and important function that is revealed more in the box art and the product description than anything else. The power miners have built this massive underground mining station to help them gather crystals, transport the precious cargo across lava rivers using the zip line. The idea here is that both sections of the station are built on opposite sides of a lava river. And the function of this set, the entire function of this set is to get the crystals from one end of the lava river to the other, which is a really cool concept. What's really interesting is that it takes 637 pieces and $80 to accomplish that seemingly simple function. The price tag of $79.99 and the piece count of 637 makes this the second largest power miner set to exist across the entire theme. And if you thought Cave Crusher was hard to get, then you have no idea what's in store for you here. This thing is rare. It was nearly impossible to find examples of this kit sold within the last six months new, though there do seem to be ones on Bricklink selling for about $350. A used version though is still incredibly difficult to find, but it is going to be significantly cheaper. You're looking at 175. I ended up parting this thing out and I was able to get some of the stickered and rare elements at a pretty reasonable cost. Interestingly enough, the hardest element to get in this set is the flex tube. In fact, this set actually includes the longest piece of flex tube included in any Lego set made up until 2022 at least, which is kind of mind boggling. There are only two listed for sale on Bricklink and they are $16 a piece each at this point. So this massive set has one simple enough function. It needs to get crystals from here to there. And it does that in the most interesting way possible. So let's see if we can play through the whole situation here. It's best not to think about the functionality of this set too seriously, because in reality, I'm not sure anyone would ever build something like this, and I'm definitely not sure if it would work. On one end, you need to get crystals into this bucket. One way to do that is to use this remotely controlled vehicle to lift them up inside. It almost has enough clearance to do that, but it just isn't quite tall enough. And it's also sitting now in the middle of our lava river that we are trying to cross, so uh, that's unfortunate. I feel like this set definitely should have included a crane up here to get pallets of crystals into the bucket, uh, but alas, it does not. We also want to get crystals into a truck, but we only have one of these. So we're just gonna have to magically get this across the river to line it up here at the base of our chute. Now that our crystals have magically appeared in there, we need to get them across the river. And so there's this massive wheel, which is a very fun piece. 
This was also included in an Exoforce set, Mobile Devastator, and that's where mine is from. So my poor Mobile Devastator is sitting over there with only three wheels. This acts as a huge flywheel, and it makes the movement you're about to see incredibly smooth. Because once you get this thing going, it's gonna keep going for some time. And it took me just two swings to bring it across. And as you can see, gravity will bring it back down. I think this is so fantastic. Look at that. I'm not touching the thing and it's going up by itself. So it might need a little more guidance once you get to this point, but you can continue to spin. What's going to happen is that these orange bars are going to catch the top of our bed. And there's a rubber band that's going to stretch. And since these are on an angle, it's going to actually allow those to pour in, which is really, really cool design. And then when I let this go, it's going to fall back into place. And this chute is designed such that all of the crystals ended up in the bed of our truck down here, which is really, really great. Nothing spilled out along the way. Nothing fell in the lava river. We got everything safely across the lava. Assuming now that our friend Geolix cannot get it, which is the whole idea of the theme to keep the crystals away from the rock monsters so they don't disrupt the surface. It's a lot of pieces. It's a lot of building. It's a lot of technic dedicated to making this very simple function work. But again, the designers have shown that they can make some really unique play features for this theme that work consistently. And this one, you have to bend reality a little bit to figure out how you're gonna get the crystals in here, where that lava river really starts and ends. But once you get in here, everything else works really smoothly. So we get another very small taste of the world the power miners inhabit. We haven't had many terrain builds at all. In fact, I can only think of two other sets previous to this one, the monster launcher polybag, and then the double monster launcher that was included with crystal sweeper gave us some of that dark bluish gray with the crystal pieces. And yeah, it's not a lot to go off of, but I love how they've used all these trans neon green crystals to make the terrain more interesting than just a few base plates. One thing that I also tended to highlight a lot in the first wave of sets was the incredible engine greebling. And we get a lot of that up here, which I think is really fun. I imagine it takes quite the mechanism to pull a bed full of crystals all the way up to this point across the lava. And so they've replicated what that might look like pretty well. There's a control station up here with some levers and a familiar one by two printed tile. Back on the other side is yet another control station meant for manning the dynamite launcher to take down Geolix. The inside is pretty simple here, featuring a walkie talkie fire extinguisher and then two printed control panels as well. I love the inclusion of a ladder here to imply some way to actually get up here. The other tower unfortunately lacks that. It would have been nice to have had a ladder somewhere, but I'm glad we get that here. And there is this small platform here on the side from which the remote controlled vehicle can be operated. The set also includes a crate with two carrots, which is delightful. Once again, continuing that trend of making sure our power miners are well fed. In terms of minifigures, we get our three regular power miners here. We've seen these guys all before in the first wave of sets. And of course we get the terrific Geolix in this set again, the trans neon green big fig rock monster. It's quite cool to finally be able to play with this set. This is something I always wanted since, you know, 2009. I finally got the last piece I needed for it uh, yesterday. And it's been delightful fun and quite satisfying to get this thing going. I was pleasantly surprised by how effective this mechanism is. I love getting a taste of the world that the power miners are in, and I would have loved to have seen more buildings styled like this. Maybe a proper headquarters as the Titanium Command Rig doesn't quite live up to that. Imagine a living space for this crew being attacked by rock monsters. It would have been great to have seen just some small terrain builds up along the sides of that, or if it would all be elevated like the buildings are here. Uh, there was so much potential there that if this theme had continued, we might have been able to explore. But number 11 is where this phase of power miners ends. So I've made it no secret here that I absolutely adore power miners, claiming it to be my favorite Lego in-house theme of all time. This second wave of sets brings a lot of the magic that the first did. 
The vehicle designs introduced here continue to be unique and quite fun with great play features all around. I love the upgrades the rock monsters have gotten. It makes them seem much more of a threat. Unfortunately, this would kind of spell the end of this era of power miners as that last and final way would be pretty close to a complete overhaul of the theme, changing out the color scheme, the costumes, and even the villains. And while some of those changes, of course, would be quite awesome, most of them fall a little bit short of what was happening here back in 2009. And even though there is so much to love here in the second wave, I don't believe it completely matches the high, high standards set by wave one. Most of those vehicles in my eyes are perfection. That wave is perfection. This wave more than anything else suffers from some really weird marketing strategies, which made some of these kits really hard to get your hands on and just overall horrible prices, where most of the sets feel at least 25% higher than they should have been priced, especially for an in-house LEGO theme. The vehicles presented here too lack a lot of the finish that the first wave of sets have, especially when you compare things like the Titanium Commander to the Thunder Drill. Vehicles like the Cave Crusher suffer from the same thing, where a lot of that armor plating has been removed to allow for the snake-like function. Even the underground mining station is surprisingly spindly, and there's no room to house your figures. Despite their flaws, this wave of sets puts a smile on my face too. There's a lot here to love, and it just makes me wish we could have seen more. The underground mining station was a great tease of what other structures and buildings could have inhabited this world. And I feel like we were robbed of three more big fig variants of the other rock monsters in the theme. How awesome would have that been? And we still never got that purple rock monster that I know a lot of people wanted. But sadly, it just wasn't meant to be. It's great all these years later to see so much love for the theme. This theme obviously stuck with a lot of people. Thank you as always for taking the time to watch these. The revisiting videos are some of the, my favorite videos to put together, and I definitely couldn't do this without the support of channel members who made purchasing these very expensive sets possible. But that's all I've got for now. You have yourself a great life, and I will catch you later.